Welcome to the On Your Side podcast. I'm Gary Harper. We all depend on our home appliances more than you think. Dishwashers, garbage disposals, washing machines. And when they break down, your first instinct might be to call a repair technician. But not so fast. On the On Your Side podcast, we're talking to Ben Schlichter. He's an experienced appliance repairman who has more than 25 million views on YouTube regarding how to fix appliances yourself and how to make them last longer. This is On Your Side with Susan Campbell and Gary Harper, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast. Welcome to the On Your Side podcast. I am Gary Harper. And I'm Todd Martin. Todd is filling in for the illustrious Susan Campbell. She's on assignment. She is always out working. She is. Yeah. Well, I mean, she's good at what she does, so she's got to get out in the field, I guess, sometimes, right? Yeah, I mean, we got to we got to keep this... Uh, got to keep it rolling. We got to keep it rolling. Yep. Got to keep it rolling. Um, by the way, Todd, thanks for being with us today. Uh, we're talking about appliances and repairing appliances, and that's something you and I know a lot about because... <laughs> we spend a lot of time in the car. We talk about a lot of things that are just mundane life things like appliances. That need to be repaired. Or, or replaced. And I'm not, I'll, I'll just admit it, I'm not a very handy guy when it comes to putting things together, installing. Um, I got a... a bike rack for my wife to put on the back of her bike and it came with I think like a thousand screws <laughs> and yeah that's going back today <laughs> too many screws but um I think our favorite channel between you and me is YouTube because there's, yeah. there's so many things on YouTube to help you along whether it's uh, putting things together just getting information or in today's case repairing appliances yeah I mean it's this came from personal experience for me that I needed to figure out what was going on with some appliances that I had. And then we were making a decision to purchase some new appliances. And so I found Ben's channel on, um, on YouTube sure. and it was incredible. The amount of great information from somebody that actually does this and sees what's going on every day. And these are major purchases that yeah. people need to make. Yeah. I mean, refrigerators, dishwashers, um, they can get, well, particularly uh, refrigerators, they can get pretty darn pricey. So you want to make sure you, you get something that's going to last and, you know, does what it's supposed to do. Hey, let's bring in Ben Schlichter. Is that, do I got that right, Ben? Yep. Sounds good to me. Yeah. So you're, uh, you own a company called Ben's Appliances. You've been repairing appliances for uh, a couple of years now, probably seven or eight years. And um, as they say, you know a thing or two about when, it, you know, when it comes to repairing appliances. Um, man, you're, you're kind of, it seems like you're maybe even losing business by sharing all your secrets, your how-to uh, secrets on YouTube. Well, I mean, are you losing business or, or do you just enjoy telling people, you know, hey, th this is a quick fix. This is how you do this. If this breaks, this is how you fix it. Tell me about that. Well, I mean, the channel just hit uh, 25 million views a few months ago. So I'm doing, I mean, I'm monetized on YouTube. So I do a lot of business on YouTube online. Um, it doesn't take a lot of business away in that people that want to try to fix it themselves are going to try whether they want to pay me to fix it or not, you know, in physically in person. And there's a good quadrant of people that just won't even touch it. They, they don't want to even risk it. They don't want to go out and buy the tools. Not everyone has a screwdriver. Um, it would be really sad and pathetic to say, tell you how many tools I had before I got an appliance repair, but it really wasn't that much. Um, so not everyone wants to try that. So I, I don't think it's, you know, slowing business down for very many people, but I mean, it's the YouTube aspects of very large part portion of my business now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, we open up the show and, and I kind of acknowledge that I'm not that handy of, of a person. Um, but my dishwasher not long ago, uh, went kaput and I didn't know what was wrong with it. It wasn't draining. And I got on YouTube and came across, um, uh, a how to repair, um, um, on, on dishwashers and I followed the directions. It turned out it was the drain pump. That was so simple for me to figure out how to take it out, got a new one, put it in. I think it was like 20 bucks where it probably, if I had somebody come out to fix it, it was probably gonna be at least probably $200, I don't know, but 
YouTube is can really be your friend when it comes to re making repairs. Um, I think last year we had about 16,000 comments on the channel. And um, it's at this point, it's, it's very overwhelming on how many questions I have, uh, how many uh, emails I get. Uh, sometimes it's how many phone calls I have to take that people have found my number. Mm. Um, it's not too hard to get. So I'm having to kind of evaluate how to take care of those things. Um, but I mean, there's, it, it, it helps a lot of people. It helps a lot of people. And I will tell you the thing about this is it helps a lot of technicians too. Um, when I get comments from professionals or semi-professionals that aren't just, you know, at home DIYers doing this, that maybe ran into a problem that they haven't seen before that I've been able to coach them through. And sometimes it's not a, the most complex thing, but they need reassurance too. Um, so it runs the gamut, but I do get, interact with a lot of people anymore. When it comes to refrigerators, um, do you work on those? <laughs> I l just got done shooting a video on a refrigerator 30 minutes before I, I jumped on this podcast. So, wow. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about refrigerators. Um, people want to know, um, common problems, maybe some brands to uh, gravitate to and other brands that you might want to think twice about because they just don't have a really good um, history. Uh, tell me a little bit about that when it comes to fridges because they're pretty expensive. So you want to make sure you get something that's going to last. Yeah. Uh, so the first thing is making sure you clean your fridge. Um, it's, it's very simple, but your refrigerator doesn't create cold it exchanges heat and cold through the coils that are inside the refrigerator. And then there's usually a hidden compartment that have the coils that expel the heat from the, the uh, heat exchange. And those are either underneath or behind your refrigerator. And, you know, just through the natural process of having a fan run over them that's hidden in the unit, um, you will get a lot of dirt inside those coils. And we ref we refurbish a lot of units. A lot of where I started and where we do a lot of our work is we get refrigerators that people throw out or otherwise get rid of. And the number of times that we will fix a refrigerator, sometimes thousands of dollars because they didn't pull it out and clean it is frightening. Um, so you're it, saying it, it, it's, it's simply pull out the refrigerator and and, and, and clean the dust from the, the coils. And, and that's something I didn't know. I mean, is that what you do? Yeah. 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 Um, if you pull your, if you pull your specific refrigerator out, I think you'll be surprised. Um, there will be some, uh, air holes on the back of it they and if they're clogged or the actual uh usually black coils um haven't been cleaned they could be clogged up and it what happens is like i said it's a heat exchanger if you have a lot of dust on that area that is supposed to exchange heat well it's not going to exchange heat you're putting like a muffle on it and um that can cause issues to where your refrigerator it may try to work too hard to cool the refrigerator enough to keep your food cold or um it, if it's too much dirt then it just won't work at all um and of course if you're, one way or the other you're putting a lot of extra stress on the machine uh so they can break faster um but Clean coils just tends to be something that's very simple, very basic. You know, it takes maybe 10 minutes. And then I would say like 75% of the refrigerators that we get into our shop don't have clean coils in some, in some manner. Sometimes it's horrible. And I, my most popular video that I even have on YouTube is like basic refrigerator maintenance. And I pulled one just randomly from my shop and I'm like, Hey, let's check the coils. I want to show you how to clean the coils. And I pull the back of it off. Um, it's on my channel. It's a GE refrigerator. And, you know, I pull the coils off the back. Cause I'm like, I think maybe these are dirty. And it's literally the dust just jumped out in my face when I opened it up. And I'm thinking, how this thing even worked before I pulled it for the video? Because it was running before I did the video. And I mean, it literally looked like you had a trash can full of junk on the back of it. And, you know, I go through and clean it and you can, you know, the before and after is really crazy. But I mean, it can get really, it can get really bad on refrigerators. And that's, it's kind of like not changing the oil in your car. Can you get away with not changing the oil? Yeah. For how long? Right. Before and, it breaks you know, down. It, yeah, and eventually it's going to have a problem. It's like with a dryer with having lint in it. Eventually, if the lint isn't cleaned out, it, it's going to break. Um, 
Hey, so uh, that's always a big one. Are, are those coils? Are they exposed, or do you have to like uh, take a panel off to to get to the coils? It depends on the brand. Most will have a metal or even cardboard panel that you'll just take some screws out with a screwdriver or, or a drill gun. Uh, some of the more basic models have that all exposed mm. uh, to where there are there isn't anything there. And every every brand and manufacturer making models just a little bit different on how they come. But usually they're just five or six Phillips head screwdrivers and you get access to everything. Yeah, uh, I can imagine what's on those coils because, I mean, you know, you, you look at the top of the refrigerator, uh, that's a place that normally isn't clean that much because, you know, the refrigerator's got pushed, it's kind of like pushed into a little cabinet space. But, I mean, you probably have dust, pet hair, all kinds of things just clogging mm. those coils, I, I can imagine. Um, yeah. Listen, my refrigerator is seven years old. I'm going to be cleaning the coils uh, <laughs> as soon as I get home today. So thanks for that. Um, dishwashers. What, what can you do to make your dishwasher last longer? Um, it's a lot of it's going to be, you know, you talked about having a uh, drain pump that went bad on yours. That is common, um, especially if you don't clean. Like usually they have sumps, uh, sumps that process your uh, your garbage, your, your, your debris from, you know, cleaning the dishes. And that filter can need cleaned very often. Um, if it gets too jammed up, it's just not going to work right. Um, and if if it gets too full, sometimes you can get garbage in the drain pump. And if you get too much garbage in the drain pump, um, it can overheat and run too much and then it's gonna break down. Um, so that's always something to look at on those kinds of units. Uh, some brands are more reliable or less reliable when it comes to that pump. Uh, some can take a little bit more damage or lack of maintenance and then others are take a little bit more finesse but usually um on dishwashers i'd say you know half the time maybe even more just that one thing just the filters either clogged or something within that process of the sumps bad yeah because i mean it's like a filter at the bottom of the dishwasher it's just i mean over time it's just going to get clogged with uh, food particles um whatever so it kind of makes sense to kind of clean that as often as you as you need to um mm -hmm. when you're thinking about it yeah just clean it uh I, I try to do mine like maybe once a month just to make sure it's it's clear and everything mm -hmm. when it comes to dishwashing soap um I, I understand that there's some soaps that are better to use because they're, they they make your dishwasher last longer. Is there any truth to that? Um, yes, because some of the it just really depends on the chemical composition of whatever the dishwashing detergent has in it. Um, I'm not privy to mention you know exact brands or styles, but people do tend to get. Um, carried away maybe even and i hate to say with all natural products mm -hmm. um for text all natural products tend to actually be worse because they only have the na have nature you know herbal you know whatever and it, which is which is very good for maybe even cleaning the dishes but it doesn't take the the, the machine's health at all into consideration mm -hmm. um and a lot of times uh it, you'll get gunk built up because it wasn't taken into consideration it may not have chemicals in it that may be considered harsh or ha harsh or have a com complex name but the reason they were in there was so that they could go through and be a little bit abrasive towards the uh, the machine components itself to strip off gunk or junk that's inside like you know with the, all the food particles those food particles don't always get stopped by the filter they're going to go you know through anything that has a, a line in it and um if you're dishwashing detergent isn't working hand in hand, I mean, it could cause further issues. Mm -hmm. uh, you see that a lot with uh, washing machines too, where people will use, you know, natural brands that are, you know, supposed to be better for your skin or better for nature, but then they did no research on the machines themselves and then machines end up burning, burning up, either leading to them going to the the recycling center or having to pay a lot of money to get them fixed because all well, that part of the environment wasn't maybe considered. And maybe that was considered, you know, why you use a harsh chemical like a citric acid or uh, some sort of sodium, like a bicarbonate or mm. um, oxyclean, which is sodium percarbonate. Uh, a lot of formulas have those types of sodium or maybe a citric acid in it that is abrasive it's not toxic or anything you can eat it but it can work to clean the machines out better i mean that's what we always use is like a lot of citric acid based stuff which is 
kind of technically natural, but um, it works really well, but it's very abrasive too. I always try to stay with the name brand dishwashing soap. It seems like it just, they, some things, even when it comes to food, some things you just can't buy generic because it just, it's not as, um, it just doesn't taste as well or in, in, in appliances, uh, you know, generic just doesn't seem to work that well. That's why. I, I agree. Yep. I agree. I agree. I agree totally. Yeah. Um, usually the, usually the name brands tend to work, um, a whole lot better, uh, just by virtue of the fact they've been around for a long time. You know, you have like uh, a tide or a cascade, mm -hmm. let's say those companies didn't invent those products cause they wanted to swindle anybody out. They've stood for a very long period of time cause it worked. Um, and even with techs, techs love, the name brands because they know exactly how they work. And usually they were built with the machines in mind, just as much as the laundry and the, the, the customer satisfaction. And whenever I hear a technician complain on the, uh, the, the professional groups that I'm a, a part of, they never complain about name brand. They never ever will complain about any name brand that you can think of, whether it's for, um, a washing machine or a dishwasher or dryer sheets or anything like that. They will almost never complain about name brands, but when you get into your more obscure brands, especially, and I hate to keep railing on all natural ones, it just seems like there's a higher rate of incident or, inter or interaction that it create problems. Yeah. Um, and maybe they didn't go through and clean the machines out um, properly. And it just seems like, with those off brands, it just gets multiplied in terms of um, potential issues. Yeah. And not only dishwashers, uh, you kind of alluded to washing machines as well. I'm a firm believer in the in brand names when it comes to laundry detergent as well. Um, I mean, you could really tell the difference with the the smell and just the cleanliness compared to generic. So it's worth the extra money to pay for a name brand, I think, when it comes to that. Um, hey, let's talk about washing machines a little bit. Um I have a washing machine. It's it's unlike any washing machine I've seen before, but I like it. It doesn't it doesn't have the uh, center agitator. It's um it's it's just like a big bucket, and it's supposed to save water. Have, have you worked on those before? Have you seen seen those? Oh yeah, I mean I'm staring at one behind my screen. Um, yeah, we, we do deal with those a lot. The ones that have wash plates on them. Yeah. Um, back in, I mean they, they started coming out in the early 2000s. Uh, kind of as like a hybrid between your standard unit with an agitator and then your front loaders. Right. Um, they use a lot less water. I'm actually working on a video right now in, involving those in compare and comparing them to uh, units with central agitators and just kind of going over, all over the maintenance and repair aspects and the quality and making suggestions on the makes and models of them. But I mean, we deal with a lot of them. They've, they're fairly prolific. I think right now in the U S about 35% of all top load or 35% of all top load washing machines don't use agitators. They use the wash plates. Um, they, they're good. They have trade-offs. Um, oh, okay. Let's, let's that, get into that. Yeah. What's the trade-off? Um, so the trade-off there, there can be multiple types of trade-offs. Um, one of the trade-offs is that people like to overload machines that have the wash plates in them because there's no agitator. You get extra room in which to do your laundry with, which is good. And the manufacturers will certainly advertise the fact that you'll get, you know, so much more capacity, but the problem with it is that it also leads people to overload them more because they're not used to having this that kind of different design. Naturally, people, if they have an agitator in their machine, they'll fill the, the, the unit up to, to where the agitator is because they know, hey, if I go past the agitator, it's not going to clean, right. which is absolutely true, which is absolutely true and exactly what the manufacturer tells you not to do. Don't fill it up past the agitator. Mm -hmm. But without the wash plate, most people are clueless. Yeah. And um, the issue is if you put too much in there, that wash plate 
only agitates at the very bottom of the tub. It does very good at scrubbing everything at the bottom of the tub, but if you overload the machine and you have a lot of wet clothes, especially when you're not using a lot of water for high efficiency, which is what those machines are designed for, then those clothes will not get moved around properly. They won't uh, get cycled in and out. And then you end up with half your clothes being clean and half of your clothes being dirty. And then you get mad at the company rather than, maybe not reading the instruction manual and understanding how to load it properly. Mm. Um, and people get mad at, at those kinds of machines because they didn't read anything. I, I can see how and why people would overload a, a machine like that without the agitator because it, there's a, just a ton of room in there and you put some clothes in and you're like, well, I can, I can do more. And if you're not careful, you're going to go all the way to the top. And like you said, the, the top layer of the clothes is not going to get any, any cleaning done whatsoever. So um, what do you call those again? Um, uh, plates? At the bottom, yeah, wash plates wash or plates. In, wash plates or impellers. It depends. Brands have different names for them, but either a wash plate or an impeller. And so many th appliances now are are c c computer generated. I guess you you can call it. Um, I have one uh, on my washer with the wash plate. I don't know if we overfilled it too much, but it was making a really bad grinding noise when it would when it would wash and and agitate and. I turned it off. I went to YouTube to find out how I could fix this. And, you know, it was weird because you had to press one button six times and then another button seven times and turn it, then turn the knob. And it was, I was reprogramming the, the computer. And after I reprogrammed it, it, it worked just fine. It, no noise whatsoever. Is that normal for most washing machines with, with computers like that? Um, that solving it is kind of a... Uh, uh, an infrequent solution. Usually there's a physical component that's gone bad, mm. but maybe the machine, I think you said it was like seven years old. So it's probably over a period of time, the machines just, you, you do get parts that settle in or break down. Mm -hmm. And um, when machines can be recalibrated like that, which a lot of most, a lot of modern machines can be recalibrated. It gives that computer a chance to kind of reset everything. Yeah. And uh, reset how it kind of predicts how it's supposed to operate. And um, sometimes it's like, it's the equivalent of having a computer and turning it off and turning it back on again. Yes, it's um, exactly right. You just reset it, reboot yeah, it. Uh, yeah, as weird as it is, just rebooting it can reset things. But a lot of times if you do that recalibration, it's physically going in and testing every single component independently in a really specific order with no clothes in it. And it's saying, oh, okay, so this part shifted a little bit. Um, we have to balance the tub out differently. And then it can solve some of those issues. Yeah, uh, you, you're dead on there because it was going through a series of like testing. And you're right, uh, it, it tested tested like i think like seven different um parts or something like that but again after it was all done it, it worked so i didn't have to i didn't have to call anybody out ben yep <laughs> I, i've saved some money yeah yeah and that's always that's what i always want people to do is save money because oftentimes what happens is people will call the technician out and if they can't solve it within an affordable amount of money then they throw away the appliance and it just creates more waste for everyone and you know, not every tech's going to be perfect on how they diagnose something and not every tech's going to be ethical about it either. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of just a reality of how things are. I mean, the, the market's starved for technicians right now. So you kind of get what you get in the industry. Mm. And, you know, I want to try to protect everyone involved in that process with whatever I've learned. Can we talk about new appliances? Because that was one of the, the, the some of the videos that I watched uh, from you because we just bought a refrigerator and a washer and dryer. And I watched videos from you on, on both of these so that I could figure out what brands to buy, what um, things to look for when you go out. And just also, can you talk to us about kind of how appliances are made now compared to how they were made kind of pre maybe 2000 or something? Because um, mm -hmm. it seems like everything now is, is modular, based and that, 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 that's a great point because my mother-in-law is still washing her clothes in the avocado green 1973 washer um that she bought brand new you know decades ago and it still works they don't I mean, as they say they don't make things like they used to mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so uh, they definitely don't make things like they used to. Um, that's something that is absolute fact. I've done a few videos on brands and makes and models, and that's what Todd had seen um, from me. But probably within about three weeks ago, I got a very interesting, I don't want to say mysterious comment from someone, but I got a comment from someone that actually builds the things. Uh, he was an engineer for one of the big three in the U.S., mm -hmm. and um, he was just – he said a few things that I'm like, okay, I, you're an engineer. I can tell that you built these things and you're the guy, you're the man behind the, um, the curtain. And I started <laughs> asking him some really specific questions that only he would know. Um, and what I'm getting at is these companies are building the machines to last an, a very specific amount of time. They do enough testing to make sure that it's going to last within the warranty period. So they're not going to be on the hook. If, if a company builds something and it's within that warranty period, it's horrific for them. Um, they have to hire a technician. Oftentimes those technicians are not employed by the company they're contracting. So, and which isn't, which is not a bad thing. It's a good thing for, you know, technicians, it gives them work. But the whole issue is from a business perspective, you know, let's say Whirlpool, I'm just throwing a name out. Um, you know, Whirlpool has to pay that technician 80 to a hundred dollars just to go look at the dang thing. And then they're going to be on the hook for whatever parts that technician says that machine needs. Well, what if that machine has a bad control board in it from the factory? at least retail that board could be $300. I don't know what they make it for, but it's not zero. So they, that the company Whirlpool could be a hundred, 150, $200 into a machine that they've sold for $600 at retail. Um, and I'm sure they have a budget for what they are, you know, they allow for warranty maintenance on those things, but it can be staggeringly high mm -hmm. um, if a machine's really bad and someone gets a lemon and they want to avoid that. But if it's outside of warranty, who cares? Um, and the, 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 the companies we even tell you, oh, we're building them to last for five years or seven years or 10 years. And it's like, that's just, that's not a very long period of time. Not when we were used to machines 20 years ago, 25 years ago, lasting forever yeah. or lasting, you know, in 2000, um, you know, you could get a Kenmore or Whirlpool washing machine. They've been in the U.S. market, obviously, for a while. You know, you could get it. And it's nothing for me to see a machine that's 15, 20 years old, make a few repairs on it that are cheap and affordable for us to do, and then send it back out knowing it's going to last for another five or 10 years. But then on the new ones, you know, they're they're built with a mean time to failure five to seven years. And they're built with the mean time of failure of five to seven years. So at that point, you're starting to see major things that have to be repaired on them to get them back up and running. And, you know, if it's say a gear case on something, the, the main transmission system, you know, at, at, you know, it's $200 to replace. Even if you're a DIYer, you're not going to get around the $200 cost of the part. Or if the board's bad, you're not going to get around the $200 cost on the board unless you do board level repairs, which I have a video or two on. But, you know, if you have soldering skills, you may be okay, but on a gear case, you're screwed. Yeah. And, you know, at that point, you're buying some, you're, you're, you're not going to save any money almost by fixing it. Yeah. It, it, instead of fixing it, you, you, you just throw your hands up and say, let's just get a new one. That's That happens all the time. Hey, Ben, are, are there certain things, like, so let's just talk about refrigerators, because we just went out and bought a refrigerator. They have things that have screens on them now, and Wi-Fi, and um, all kinds of bells and whistles on these. Should Obviously, that's very, you know, uh, marketing-wise, that's good for those companies, because people are looking for those things. But are, are there certain things that people should look for in appliances? I mean, should they avoid things that have a lot of bells and whistles or... Um, Just one more thing extra to break yeah. Wi-Fi. Uh, what would you use Wi-Fi yeah. on, on a refrigerator? Yeah, so um, the, two, the two sides to that, I would say, is the one thing you absolutely want to avoid if you're getting a refrigerator is if you can avoid getting an ice maker that's in the door. I, it's always very convenient to have that ice maker and ice whenever you want it in the door, but mechanically, uh, thermodynamically, it's the worst thing that anyone's ever invented. Um, probably half the failures on a refrigerator aren't going to be the refrigerator. It's going to be that freaking ice maker. Um, and that goes for practically any brand, any make, any model. You're taking an ice maker that has to be very cold. 
and you're wrapping it in a cabinet you it, 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 for convenience sake it's in the fresh food cabinet the upper cabinet so it's th that cabinet's warm that cabinet is warm it's about 38 degrees it has high moisture content because it keeps your food fresh so it's 80 percent moisture content 60 to 80 percent moisture content in your refrigerator cabinet well the ice maker needs zero percent moisture content because if you get moisture in that cabinet it's cold it's going to freeze everywhere and then you get ice crystals and then it jams up the ice maker and then it damages the ice maker over a period of time and then you have to go get a new ice maker new sensors whatever's involved in that process and i mean if you look at my videos if you adjust every if you just go on my channel and click water bins top videos and you look at the repairs i don't treat anything one way or the other differently but most of my top videos are ice maker repairs and that's something to avoid hey listen um if people want to find out more about you or they want to see your videos, um, th throw it out there to us. Are your handle or uh, websites, anything? Yeah, uh, Ben's, appli Ben's Appliances and Junk on YouTube. Um, I think I have everything involved with that name wrapped up. So if you just Google that name or YouTube that name, mm -hmm. you're going to find out, you know, whatever. I stick mostly to YouTube and that I don't do a whole lot of other social media things. Mm -hmm. um, I just try to stick to repairs and you know advice well you do a really good job and i see why you have um millions of views so keep up a good work uh good conversation um i'm gonna go home now and clean my refrigerator coils because i feel like i have to okay ben yep sounds good <laughs> all right man thanks for being on the on your side podcast have a great day <laughs> see ya the On Your Side podcast is produced by Brad Denny. Our audio engineer and editor is Todd Martin. Segment producer is Colin Stanton. And I'm Gary Harper. And I'm Susan Campbell. If you have a problem you can't resolve, maybe we can. Send us a message through azfamily.com or our AZ Family mobile app. Look for the On Your Side section and leave us a message. Thanks so much for listening to the On Your Side podcast. And if you like it, leave us a review. We'll see you next week. On Your Side is on Good Morning Arizona every weekday morning at 6.45 and 7 o'clock and every weekday evening on Good Evening Arizona at 4 and 5 o'clock. You can also catch it on Arizona's Family News at 9 on 3TV every weeknight.